Hello, I'm Aminta Dawson with the ACES staff. I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled Critical Data Modeling, sponsored by DCMI. Our distinguished pre presenter is Dr. Karen Wicked, who will be introduced by our moderator, Dr. Inkyung Choi. Dr. Inkyung Choi is a teaching assistant professor at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Her research interests stem from her intellectual curiosity about social and cultural pluralistic perspectives, which influence ways of organizing knowledge. She also serves at the DCMI Education Committee. I'd like to ask the audience to type your questions into the question panel box and they'll be answered at the end of the presentation. I'll now turn the session over to Dr. Inkyung Choi, who will introduce our presenter. Uh, thank you, Aminta. Uh, <clears throat> so let's just start with the introduction of Dr. Karen Wicket. Dr. Karen Wicket is assistant professor in the School of Information Science at the University of Illinois. And um, she is also co-chair of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative Education Committee. Uh, Dr. Wicket's research area includes information organization, metadata, knowledge organization, and data modeling. Dr. Wicket uh, is most interested in the analysis of common concepts and data models in information systems. In the webinar today, Dr. Wicket will describe the result of critical data modeling of police arrest record data set and discuss how conceptual modeling can help us synthesize critical information studies and identify new opportunities for modeling and critics which I am very excited to hear about. And then, yeah, uh, Dr. Wicket, um, please, uh, everyone, welcome Dr. Wicket. And then, Dr. Wicket, please now feel free to start sharing. Uh, I'll turn this session over to you. Great, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Uh, as you just heard, uh, I am Karen Wicket. And, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is based on a uh, paper that I just published recently in um, JSIST. Uh, so I'll go um, and uh, with the same title, uh, well, it's called Critical Data Modeling and the Basic Representation Model. Uh, so I'll put up the reference to that in just a second. Uh, but I want to thank everyone uh, for joining me today. and. I'm going to talk through some big ideas about critical data modeling, show some things about the basic representation model, but then mostly I want to spend my time talking about um, examples of um, issues that I could highlight with this method looking at a police record uh, database uh, or well data set. So, what is critical data modeling? The idea of critical data modeling is to use data modeling and systems analysis techniques to closely examine the creation and implementation of information systems and more broadly information objects. So um, what do I mean by uh, data modeling and systems analysis techniques? This is things like um, either ex close examination of a metadata schema based on documentation or uh, sort of inferring a metadata schema by looking at a data object and then modeling with uh, UML or also perhaps using uh, relational database queries or structured queries to look at how that uh, schema is realized in a data set. And why to do this is that this can let us expose unjust or biased assumptions in data models or algorithms. So this is kind of teasing out uh, from a big complicated data set uh, what's gone into the assumptions that, that let that data set do the things it's intended to do. And to highlight the technical role of those assumptions within a system, right? So, um, one of the things that go, is going on here um, is that I'm trying to expose these assumptions in the language of the technical systems in which they're embedded. Uh, my position is that this will help us validate and expand existing critiques and also enable the development of more equitable information systems. Uh, so, 
And as I said, this was, uh, I have a recent JSIST paper called Critical Data Modeling and the Basic Representation Model in JSIST. Uh, and uh, the, the link is there in my slides. So part of the position here is that given how pervasive information representation decisions and these that, that end up uh, shaping our lives, you know, so we uh, interact with information decisions systems every day in multiple ways, in multiple uh, sort of uh, modes of our lives, right? So we work with them, we bank with them, we um, teach with them, uh, they are a massive part of our criminal justice systems, and they're a massive part of our social lives as well, right? So the, these digital platforms are created with um, a lot of information representation decisions uh, that are structuring those systems. Uh, Ruha Benjamin, in her book, Race After Technology, uh, which I highly recommend, uh, shows how information systems have created this um, system of oppression that actually gets obfuscated by the technical nature of the systems involved, right? It's hard for us to understand how the system is operating to um, impact communities negatively because there are all of these layers and um, data comes from different places and things are kind of um, put together in a way that makes us hard to makes it hard to trace out um, how these systems are negatively impacting people and where the negative impacts are really embedded into the systems. Uh, so, right, as I say, these complex relationships and layers of encodings are part of the realization of a digital object and contribute to that obfuscation in the analysis of modern information objects and systems. Uh, so, my proposal is that we use data modeling to help tease these things out. So, what do I mean by data modeling? Um, stepping back a bit, a data model is a set of labels for categories and a set of assumptions about how those categories will be handled in a computational system, right? So to give a simple example, you might have a class roster that's structured according to a data model where you've uh, categorized people as students and you've also cat you've also um, categorize the information about those students, like their name, their ID number, um, their and maybe their email address, how many credits they've enrolled for in your course, right? So, um, and then you also have assumptions about how those categories will be handled in your computational system, right? So um, that your email addresses will fit a certain syntax, and that you might have some kind of system that lets you pull out email addresses to do a mass mailing to everyone in your class. Um, <clears throat> it's important to realize that every information system uses data models to structure data and specify processing. This is not something we can ever get away from. And when we do data modeling, it's necessary that we reduce our real world entities into the set of attributes defined by a data model, right? So obviously we can't record every possible piece of information about our students in our classes. Uh, we have to reduce them to this set of categories that, we, that are relevant uh, for managing a class. This means then that we take a position on when we create a data model, we're taking a position on what matters about those entities. We elevate some aspects like ID numbers and we leave other aspects out. Like we don't um, record the name of all our students' pets in our class roster, right? It would just clutter it up. It's not what we need uh, in that information system. Okay, so I want to talk a bit about uh, one of the tools that I used in this uh, paper and this analysis is the basic representation model. Uh, this is a general model, 
for information representation and encoding in digital objects. Uh, it was initially developed in the context of a project for understanding preservation and sharing of scientific data. But as you see, these uh, entities and relationships are very general. Um, my argument is that we can use this as an organizing framework for critical readings of data sets and systems. I don't have time for it um, in my presentation today, uh, but if you look at my JSIST paper, you can see that I talk about how existing uh, critical information studies can be organized according to this um, model, where some critiques happen at the level of propositional content or the expression of propositional content. Some critiques have to do with symbol structures and encodings. In general, the model lets us name entities and relationships involved at any level of representation or encoding, which is really important for building out a full-fledged analysis of an information system. And it also highlights the interconnections between information representation choices at various levels. Um, so when I talk about some of the examples, I'll show one that you can really only see by understanding what's going on um, kind of at the data uh, encoding and data expression levels. Um, so using this model uh, lets us kind of organize our critique. So we have an information system. We know it has some impact on a community, but we might not know kind of where to start. So using this very general conceptual model can help us get started on an analysis by just saying, okay, I'm going to characterize propositional content. I'm going to characterize how it's um, expressed by symbol structures. I'm going to, I'm going to characterize encoding and this can help um, structure and initialize a critical reading of a data set or an information system. So just briefly, I'll go over the entities and relationships in this model. If you want more uh, detail, once again, I will gesture to my paper. Uh, so expressions and encodings in various forms are conveying propositional content to an audience, right? So if we go back to our class roster example, the, the propositional content is this series of facts about the students enrolled in a class. Uh, that could be ex expressed in many different ways, right? So this is a general entity relationship diagram here. It's not showing uh, kind of the specific uh, encoding and expression relationships. Uh, so one thing we need to recognize in this kind of analysis is that we might have the same propositional content expressed by many different uh, symbol structures. So we could uh, express that content as a table of data. So in my uh, university, if I go to the registrar system, I can get my class rosters as TSV, um, tab separated values, or you might have it as an XML document, or you might have it as a series of sentences in natural language, right? You could just write out all of these facts about your students in your class. Less convenient for processing, but it's the same propositional content. In the model, we're looking at symbol structures as expressing semantic content in a particular context, right? So that table structure expresses the propositional content about my class roster. Symbol structures also importantly encode other symbol structures within a computational system. Uh, the layers and levels of encoding here are modeled by a series of encoding relationships between symbol structures. Um, this is an important aspect of this model that is one of the things that makes it generalize well for digital objects um, and information systems because we don't know upfront how many levels of, and layers of encodings we might encounter. It depends on the kind of system we're using, right? So um, 
an XML document, for example, is then further encoded by uh, according to the UTF schema, which is then uh, encoded onto a memory device, um, perhaps with various layers uh, in between, depending on what kind of um, operating system and file management we're doing. Uh, at a certain point, since we are uh, material beings in a material world, we are going to encounter information via pattern matter or energy that's carrying the inscription of symbol structures, right? So my um, binary data after a certain point is written onto a flash memory device or a hard disk. My um, class roster, I might encounter it via the um, uh, re-expression from having saved it on my flash memory device onto my screen, or I might print it out onto paper and encounter that inscription as um, little bits of ink onto, or sorry, little bits of usually toner, I guess, uh, arranged onto a piece of paper, right? So um, here we want to recognize that while uh, propositional content and symbol structures are these abstract entities, at a certain point we encounter uh, material objects, which is um, which therefore also shapes how we can do these things, how we can uh, encode and share information. Okay, so I'm going to move now into my um, critical reading of a police record data set. So this is a data set uh, that was published by um, the Los Angeles Police Department through their through the City of Los Angeles open data platform. And the one I look at in the paper and I'm going to talk about today is called Arrest Data from 2022 Present. Um, I believe when I uh, did the analysis, it had the latest update was sometime in uh, 2022. So it's about two years of um, arrest records from LAPD. And what I did was um, a close reading of the dataset version uh, and dataset version. So I did look at different uh, formats of the dataset that were available through the platform. And I think of this work as critical, uh, uh, sorry, as technical close reading. So I'm doing a close reading of um, metadata, data documentation, and also reading the data set through structured queries that I designed based on my reading of the metadata. Um, so as I read the data documentation, I sometimes saw discrepancies between what was stated in the um, uh, sort of natural language descriptions for the columns in the data set and then what would show up in the data types uh, that were more that were kind of provided by the open by the open platform developer uh, which was Socrata. Um, so for example, arrest date here says MMDDYYY, but really uh, the data platform says this is a floating uh, date. Uh, oh, sorry, floating timestamp, right? So here, which is what they mean by date and time. And so you can see this looks a little bit different, whereas the rest of these are kind of plain text. So that's kind of a discrepancy here because uh, floating timestamp has different requirements than just being MMDDYY, right? So uh, that led me to ask particular questions of the data set uh, via, via structured queries or filtering um, the data set. And for the most part with this data set, I used OpenRefine to examine the data. Okay, so some of the things I found, my critiques based 
around, and these, um, in the paper, I organized these according to the entities in uh, the basic representation model. So I start with critique of the propositional content. And part of what's going on here is that when you look at these um, data sets, and I'm also looking at the context in the open data platform and the examples they give and how the entire data set is described, right? So it's uh, important to notice here that they, they consider this public safety data and they also consider this geographic data. Uh, so I'll come back to that point. But they say here very clearly, each row represents an arrest. And if you look at the positioning in the open data platform, the examples they give, the discussions they give, um, there's an assumed correspondence here between a row in the data set and a criminal incident, right? Which is separate from an arrest, right? Um, and so there's kind of, if you look at the way these get mapped and presented as public safety data, there's kind of, an implicit assumption of a one-to-one -one correspondence between arrests and criminal incidents. In other words, if someone was arrested, uh, there was a crime, and if there was a crime, someone was arrested, right? That's obviously, um, obviously in the little, in the real world, things are more complex. Um, it's important to note also that this is this is kind of driven home by the fact that location information in the data set, which I'll come back to, um, but as you see here, right, they location is um, elevated in the open data platform. There's this whole category of does this data set have location data? Is it latitude, longitude? Um, here, you're not reflecting the location of an of the arrest. The location in the data set is the location of a criminal incident. Um, now, from a public safety standpoint, that's what you want to know. Uh, but it, sh it uh, when you start to detect some of the issues in the data set, it becomes um, more evident why this is problematic. So one way to see how this um, is problematic. I mean, I think first off, we can just recognize that sometimes people are arrested for crimes they did not commit. Uh, but beyond that, in this data set, um, it's very clear that some rows do not correspond to suspected cr criminal activity of the person described by that row, right? So they say um, each row represents an arrest, I would say more um, accurately, each row represents a person that was arrested. Um, I say that in part because there is a lot of information about the, the people being arrested, like their age and their sex code. There is, no, there is no information about the police officers who conducted an arrest, right? So um, if you look at an arrest event, you might say, okay, someone is arresting someone else but the person doing the arresting is just absolutely disappeared from this data set. The person being arrested is the only person present in the data set. Um, now I understand there might be reasons for that, but we have to in, um, examine those kinds of assumptions and, and we can do that via looking at the data model. So one that I look at and I talk about in the paper is um, children in this data set, right? So if you filter the data set on charge description, which is like, why was this person arrested? And you look at the value parent and custody, no take, caretaker available. Um, this gives you 99 rows, all of, with, all of those rows have ages between zero and 17 in the data set. Uh, so what's going on here is that these represent children taken into custody by the LAPD when one or both of their, of their parents uh, were arrested usually. Uh, um, and I figure this out by, look, by, by structured queries, kind of looking at what else is going on with that row. Um, and 
another way to look at this is to look at age. And you notice that um, when you look at age, you can filter uh, for age zero in the data set. So these are you know, babies taken into custody by LAPD. And these rows tend to be very sparse, right? Um, so they don't, um, they tend not to have um, the charge listed. They tend not to have charge description, although some of them have that value that I was just talking about. Um, but 66 of the 98 rows that I found here have no charge description listed, so it's unclear why LAPD arrested these babies. And only, um, only two of those rows have um, missing location data, right? So uh, 96 of those rows list a latitude and location um, for, a, and once again, these seem to list the, 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 um, the location of a criminal incident, not the location of an, of an arrest. So for example, if the parent was arrested in conjunction with a criminal incident that happened at some location, and then their two children were taken into custody, you would get all three of those, ro those, those um, incidences as showing up at that criminal location. So it looks like three crimes happened there. Um, that's at least my reading of this data. Uh, so we can see why this is really problematic. Um, <clears throat> as, I've, as I said before, this data set heavily foregrounds location, right? So we see here location specified is a big deal. And uh, by looking at the data model, we can see 10 of the 25 available attributes offer information about geographic location at varying levels of granularity. Uh, this is opposed to say, on the other hand, there's no information about the officers who conducted the arrest. You can also see this foregrounding of location when you look at the export formats, right? So here's, um, there are three main formats. These are the ones I mentioned here. Uh, CSV, KML, and Shapefile. KML and Shapefile are both geographic data formats. So when I look at this, I feel like this platform really wants me to download this data and put it into a GIS system and do some mapping visualization with it. So in other words, the data set is positioned as geographic information. Uh, why does this matter? Uh, if you look in um, urban studies and geography, you find these arguments about criminal justice systems transforming information about crime and um, people accused of crimes into geographic information. And this has a significant impact on how we understand places and people in our communities and how we understand uh, crime and criminal justice. Uh, so I recommend, uh, this is a book by Brian Jefferson called Discipline and Punish, uh, that's about digital information systems and policing uh, that, um, that, I, that was in, in, inspirational for some of these arguments. And I feel that my evidence here aligns strongly with his arguments. Another thing that you can see in the data set is, um, what I call uh, sort of data type conformance over accuracy. Uh, and this is something that you really can only see if you're looking at those different levels of representation uh, in the data set. Uh, so here's an example with time. So here's that, um, this is what I was talking about with floating timestamp. So arrest date, here's arrest date. So when the arrest happened, uh, both uh, they, both these attributes use the floating timestamp data type. Uh, to conform with this data type, the values have to include a time. And you can see here that the times are suspicious when you examine the data, right? Um, so, and it, in fact, um, what, there's 174,000 rows in this data set, I believe, and every time listed 
in arrest date and booking date is 12 a.m. and zero seconds. Uh, and in fact, you can see another attribute right next to it that um, it's hard for me to determine the accuracy of this attribute, but certainly the distribution of these values seems much more, uh, gives, gives a greater impression of accuracy than everything happening at midnight. Um, and there's one for arrest date and there's one for um, booking date. Each of them give um, this 24-hour uh, time uh, style uh, kind of value. So you can, you can use the data set to look at what time arrests happen, but you can't use arrest date, which has that time information in it, uh, for that to do that. And I think this is significant because it shows how the, uh, the, the conformance to this data type which was sort of provided by the open data developer, the, sorry, the platform developer, um, has overridden any concern for accuracy, right? So we have, we have inaccurate and actually conflicting data in the data set. Um, and for whatever reason, um, I mean, I can imagine easily the reasons why, but I, I don't know them. Um, it's easier to just put in the time here as a separate column than trying to put it into that floating timestamp value, but then you end up with these strange inaccuracies in your data set. The other place we see this kind of um, data type conformance over accuracy is with location. Um, and this is, this is, This is directly uh, documented in the data set metadata. So the summary says some location fields with missing data are noted as 0, 0, 0 point, by 0 point. Um, so as it's, so this is using this actual location as a missing data indicator in the data set. This I think is actually a pretty common practice um, but it is still an inaccuracy, and it require and you can you find tutorials about this kind of data set, and they very blithely say you just filter out those rows. Um, but without kind of um, but then you're sh you're shifting what's going what you can learn from the data set via this filtering, uh, and so there's a bias being introduced there, and this point appears in 4,640 number uh, rows in the data set. And uh, I think it's important to note here that every row in the data set has a location that matches this point data type. Even rows that were missing location data in the original arrest record. So there are other ways you can indicate missing data rather than just putting in a nonsense location, right? That's actually a real point on the globe, right? So there's kind of this um, conflict between um, conforming to the data type and maintaining accurate data or consistently indicating missing values in a way that doesn't um, uh, use an actual uh, location value from the globe. Uh, so yeah, as I've been saying, this is uh, your maintain, maintaining, maintaining conformance with the data type has taken precedence over accuracy of the data here. And it was awareness of those levels of representation and interaction between the levels that let me really analyze um, these cases. Okay. So those are my um, examples from reading the data set. And I will just um, have some conclusions here. I really feel that information science is called as a field to examine the ways in which social injustices are built into our information systems through our data models. Um, I also think, oh, sorry. I also think it's really important for us to push on the genres of information systems and information objects that we examine in our field. Uh, we have a tendency to, um, be really interested in, say, scientific data. We have a tendency to be really interested in um, library data. These are all really good and important areas for analysis, but I think we can move 
um, into the other kinds of spaces and, and be more present in arguments about social media um, information systems, criminal justice information systems, financial information systems, these kinds of things that are really impacting people's lives. Um, and um, when, you when you find the arguments and analysis around critical, that are um, really tracing power relations and how these systems are impacting people, those are often happening um, in sociology departments, um, with economists and not and I have a I feel that we are not as present in those conversations as we should be as a field so I want to kind of push us in that direction um, I'm proposing critical data modeling here as a method for analyzing data models and existing data objects in order to examine the socio-technical commitments underlying assumptions and social and cultural consequences of information systems now, um, I want to acknowledge, right, that you can't necessarily um, find all of these things via critical data modeling, right? These things about social and cultural consequences are found by examining the impact of the information system. That is kind of a more sociological study than what I'm proposing here. Uh, but as I said earlier, I think it's really important to then tie those critiques to the technical uh, systems that we're working with, and critical data modeling can let us do that. I also argue here that the basic representation model provides a logical framework for critical interrogation of information objects, uh, and I showed some examples on how that can be done. I think the basic representation model um, it's just one tool that can be used, uh, but I find it to be um, a good way to kind of break into a data set or break into an information system and think about what's going on and look at um, what the data model allows us to, to even have access to for our algorithms uh, and um, to look at things at that level. And uh, that's my presentation. So. Thank you for attending. <laughs> and um, if if we have questions, I'm happy to answer them or continue the conversation. Hey, thank you so much, Karen. Yeah, um, I was really like being absorbed <laughs> into your talk. Um, well, I think uh, we can now like have some question and answer time or some discussion or conversation uh, to start. Um, I actually have a, a couple of questions. It's more like a discussion kind of questions. So first of all, I, I really like this work and then the example where the uh, police data was really perfect, I think. And then I believe this work can really enlighten like current data modeling practice and then uh, that make it more critical and also considerate of the what's not intent, not included like even unintentionally right um so and then this is a great tool to tackle like current information system as you discussed i like to learn a little bit more about like how you see this critical data modeling techniques for practical use so i, I think we can think of a lot of you know like implications here one possibility for me you know as a more like a metadata sort of a person, maybe this critical analysis um, as a guide, guideline to evaluate the existing schema or uh, data model in the metadata schema, or maybe more practically have some like uh, guidance on the committee work over, you know, like the existing metadata schema or some kind of data intervention tools um for machine learning technology in that field so i just want to have a broad conversation about you know how you see this for the practical use yeah great question thank you um so i see a lot of as you were sort of indicating right there's a lot of different directions uh, one direction is to look at um 
say, uh, the large language models that are currently driving a lot of the um, AI technology and kind of look directly at what's going on uh, there in terms of data modeling. What do they, um, what do they, again, what do they elevate and what do they diminish and how does yeah. that uh, shape what comes out of um, a AI uh, writing tool or an AI, you know, one of the um, examples that I talked briefly about is, um, again, in the criminal justice system with um, the sort of um, algorithms to in give a score for yeah. sentencing someone um, based on their background. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to look at there is the sources of the data that go into that and, and kind of what are the models there and how do they, um, and then what's this process of shifting from kind of um, this existing data into sort of a score. Uh, mm -hmm. So looking at that um, at, a, at a detailed level. And then I think also, so one of the areas that I'm also working with is um, uh, sort of critical archival studies mm -hmm. and bringing the, the arguments from critical archival studies into the metadata for digital collections. Mm -hmm. uh, so really looking at digital collection metadata uh, and, and also just how collections are structured, how collections are described, and what kind of navigation is provided uh, for a digital collection. Mm. A large digit, like the digital, sorry, uh, the Library of Congress digital collections and what the categories there communicate to the people um, coming there to find resources. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, in terms of like how, where, so, so it's kind of like, where do we go from here? Um, I'm, I'm looking for those areas. Uh, one of the things we were looking at with, um, uh, in terms of digital collections, is this idea of um, counter narratives. Out, how can you describe historical materials in a way that enable uh, community members, like regular people, to tell stories, new kinds of stories around existing resources? Um, and then how do you describe that? Because the idea of a counter narrative is, is a little bit contrary to the ways we think about metadata. Mm -hmm. uh, we tend to think about metadata as, um, as not being narrative. Mm -hmm. We tend to think about it as kind of just, just um, more of a database. But I think there's a compelling argument that metadata itself is a narrative object and it tells a story. And mm -hmm. often metadata for historical digital collections is reiterating um, the oppressor's view of mm -hmm. some historical group, right? So uh, how do you break out of that? Yeah. Uh, and then how do you provide something that is also of um, high quality and makes resources accessible uh, but also um, in ca in can enable uh, sort of that counter storytelling piece. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a long yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it was really good. I, you know, I asked you long questions. So um, we have a question from audience here. Um, I will just read this uh, from you uh, for you. It's from Joanne. Um, thank you so much for presenting this important work. I'm curious to know how these systems data models are being developed, who is entering the data and what training is done to assist people in creating records and using the system. Yeah, I'm wondering what issues result from the inaccuracy you have identified uh, and the many others that clearly occur at the record level. Right. Yeah. So um, I'll say that, like, I I sort of shaved off a really small piece of this to look at for this paper. Right. Uh, and I consider this kind of a, a, a starting point. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, so my. And there's a lot of unanswered questions I have about this police arrest record data set. 
uh, the 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 document there's no process documentation on on you know through the open data platform and i will say though that my impression is that um that the that the open data platform developers really shaped what you see in terms of the data model there so this is this and and that there is this data source, which is these um, police records that are redacted in certain ways, right? So, and that's appropriate. I want to say, like, you know, you should not. I don't. I don't think you should have uh, the names of arrested individuals in this data set. But then it's also, but um, but if you look at the data set and the way they keep, they restate the locations over and over again. And I think that's both because of this, um, if you look at the ways that the sort of like smart city and open data kinds mm -hmm. of um, the rhetoric around it, it's really about like people can build maps of the things going on in their cities is one of the main use cases for this kind of open data platform. So I think that's where this emphasis on look that's that's at least part of where this emphasis on location is going is coming from and it has to do with the fact that there are um just tools that will let you map those locations out um in a pretty um let's say like pretty quickly right like mm -hmm. you can can make a map from this data set pretty uh in a pretty straightforward way if you have the software um so i think that that so it's actually very odd when you look at the way because they have location which is latitude and longitude and then they also have a column for latitude and a column for longitude and from a data modeling perspective um like from a relational database design perspective that's bad modeling right because you're 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 reiterating the data and that gives you uh opportunities for uh errors and um and, and also opportunities for weird results where you reuse the data and you, you count incorrectly. Um, so I think part of it, I'm really interested in this interaction between the developer and the city and the police department and kind of what happened there. But it's yeah. beyond the scope of what I did here, but I think a full critical reading of this, of uh, police records would take that into account, and mm -hmm. what I would what I would love to um, to see, but might require like FOIA, um, would be kind of like what are what is the form what are what are the arrest record what's the arrest record originate as in the police department? They mm -hmm. say in on the platform that they came from paper arrest records, which mm -hmm. I, I believe they say that which seems um unlikely uh but is perhaps the case perhaps police officers are filling these things out on paper still um mm -hmm. but i think there may be some computer intervention there so it's hard to so so what i'm trying to highlight here are the errors that i can see just by looking at the data self data set itself because they're mm -hmm. inconsistent um mm -hmm. And because I know that LAPD is not arresting people in the, off the coast of Africa, um, but it's hard to, to figure out the origins of other um, mm -hmm. things. And it's it's easy for me to imagine things, but this is not about my imagination, right? This is about mm -hmm. kind of like what we can read from the data cell itself. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Like following following up that, like upon on that, can I um, also like I'm curious also like your um, you know conceptualization of critical data modeling for now. The scoping of that is to the scoping is of that is on the data set itself, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a there's a reason there's well. There's a strategic reason for that um, is that this is what I can access, um, and I can feel that um, it's important to have tools that researchers can 
get some traction uh, without mm -hmm. having to have a special relationship with an organization um, mm -hmm. like the LAPD or going through a lengthy um, information request process. Uh, so this is so part of this is about mm -hmm. uh, building tools that people can work with can work with what's accessible kind of to the public. Um, mm -hmm. So looking at say if you get a credit report, uh, what do you see there and what's the data mm -hmm. model for what you as a consumer see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is a really important piece, uh, but I recognize there are other important pieces that you can't see from that. Um, yeah. And so, but that's a longer kind of um, endeavor to, to, to kind of build right. that relationship. Uh, but I think it is important to be able to do, to work as kind of outsiders to a system and not mm -hmm. um, require that you have, um, kind of made a lot of friends at that place before, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that's there, if you, you look at, um, there's say algorithmic audits going on um, with healthcare systems um, that I think that's really important work too, uh, but it just ha has to happen on a different kind of time scale. Mm -hmm. Well then in terms of that, like, um... I just curious that on that open data platform you were actually looking at, um, were there any sort of like requirement of the data documentation uh, when the data set is shared or it's just a minimal description of that, you know, like that structure? So I didn't look, so I'm not sure what you mean. Like, so like if someone takes that data set and uses it somewhere, do they have to credit it or? Oh you no! Mean, like when that open open uh, data platform share those, you know, like data set uh, from like probably like from the policy report or somewhere, um, do they need to acquire also the data dictionary or more data detailed data documentation yeah. to be shared? Right. So my uh, so my what the impression I get from looking at the data platform is that they did that the, the platform developers did work, so there's different departments represented, right? Mm -hmm. And I have the impression that they did work with the department, right? So they did work with the mm -hmm. police department to develop the data set. And there are a few other data sets that are from LAPD. Um, so it, there's this, there is this impression of collaboration there. And the and, and my impression is that the data dictionary was uh, built collaboratively, mm -hmm. but I also have the impression that the data, and this is something that I don't, I'll say I don't have strong evidence of this, just kind of like, um, I suspect the developer pushed particular formats that work well with their API, mm -hmm. right? So there's mm -hmm. also API access. And so I think they were, um, they were, they were kind of um, maybe, uh, I so so right so my my impression right is that I don't think the original arrest records had latitude and longitude in them. I think they I have see. addresses, and then there's the then then they they want to anonymize the particular address, so they go out to the block level, and then there's a they, and then at some point I'm guessing actually the platform. Um, assigns latitude and longitude based on the. Uh, um, so, so that's kind of that's the picture of the process that I get from looking at the platform. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and yeah, so there's also like, sanitation district also has data there that, um, for example, that probably worked mm -hmm. in a similar way where there was some departmental um, conversation before the data was sort of fully designed. Yeah, yeah, thank you for <laughs> answering my question. I think I, I took uh, too much time, you know, like uh, with my curiosity questions. Um, but I just asked that question because I believe your critical data modeling uh, <clears throat> is also suggest to read critically the data set as well as the data documentation together, Absolutely. right, to explain. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Because, because um, that data set documentation is part of the positioning of the data set, right? So in this case, 
the way they 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 foreground location you can see it in the data set you can also see it in the documentation exactly yeah i appreciate your answer and then um if you have any other question please you can type in a uh, question chat um, otherwise you can actually directly contact karen um yeah. she has i think we have your contact address on the webinar um, yeah. So, yeah, feel yeah. free to also directly contact to Carrot. Yeah. Okay. Um, any any other final comment from audience? Okay, well, um, I really appreciate um, Karen like sharing this work with everyone, um, like SS and DC community. Uh, I, I, I see this, the importance of this work, uh, and then, yeah, it was it was a really great talk. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Karen Wickett for presenting this very interesting webinar. I also want to thank Dr. In Kyung Choi for moderating the session. I want to remind attendees that one of your many ACES member benefits is complimentary access to all webinars. A recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides will be posted to the ACES website by tomorrow and will be, and will be available to all ACES members and paid registrants. Within 24 hours, attendees will receive an email with the recording of the webinar and a survey. I encourage you to complete it within seven days. Again, I'm Aminta Dawson with the ACES staff, and I thank you for attending today's webinar. This concludes the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.